Hello, welcome back. So if you're just joining me from the first video, you'll know that we were trying to recreate this. So this is a visual representation of a sorting algorithm. It takes an unsorted array of values, where the value is represented by the height, and it sorts them into ascending order. So in the last video, we reached the point where we had successfully plotted the unsorted array and also plotted the sorted array using two sorting algorithms, the quick sort and the insertion sort. So in this video, we're going to go ahead and implement all the required functions in order for us to actually be able to visualize this. And because this is Python, I'm a big fan of object orientation. What does this mean? It means that we're going to create an object to keep track of all these different things. So typically, when we're doing these sorting algorithms, especially the ones that we saw on YouTube in the previous video, they all had a common theme that they would tell you how many array operations were performed, or at least array comparisons were performed. So we're going to do something similar. And to do this, rather than create a complicated object that basically mix a NumPy array, what we're going to do is we're going to sort of attach onto it and add some extra functionality. So I think one easy way to do this, we're going to create a class. We're going to call it a tract array, and we're not going to inherit anything. But what we're going to do, when this class is initialized, we're going to give it an array to track. So we're going to type self.r, which means that this variable r is access, can be accessed from anywhere within inside the class. We're going to give that a value of the original array. So we're going to create a copy of it. Then we're going to call a function called reset, because this might be useful in the future. Even if it's not, it's good practice to have sort of an initialization class separate to a function that will then perform things like reset arrays. So within the class itself, it's not going to be a very lightweight class. It's going to record the state of the array at every time an element is accessed. And we're going to store certain things about this object, about the array that's been tracked. So we're going to store the index that has been accessed, whether this is a read or write. We're going to store the value at that index that has been read or written. We're going to define the access types, whether it was a get or a set. And then we're going to also store a full copy of the array at every point. So this class can potentially become very large if we do a lot of operations. But for the purpose of tracking, this makes the animation a lot easier. And what actually happens in Python when you go ahead and do things like type this, so array of zero, so get the zeroth index of the array, for example, or any of the indices, even any of the indices, it's calling a method called getItem, which can be called by doing this. So these are called magic methods. See, it returns the item at that point. So this is simply a function that belongs to the class. So we can go ahead and override that function in our tract array. This is saying is that when we use this operator here, this index operator on our tract array to get an item, simply calls this function. And what we do is we return the method of the array itself. And likewise, when we do this operation here, array zero equals something, for example, What's actually happening is we're calling this method, this magic method, set item. So as you can see, we've set the array element zero to one, so it's worked. We can go ahead and implement that in our function in our class as well. Now we've got the set item and get item, which are simply passed into the function, and we return the array's native get item and set item. So when accessing this tract array using the index operator, it returns as if it was just the regular NumPy array. The last function we use to define the length. So when we type length of an object in Python, it's actually calling this function, this magic method, len is returned. And we can do the same. We can override that function in our tract array to simply return the length of the array inside so it's a transparent operation so whenever we access this tract array using the index operator and the length operator it acts just like the internal numpy array 
And these are the only functions that we're going to be using. These are the only magic methods that we're going to require from our NumPy array to be exposed in our tract array. And what we need to do now, is you notice I've implemented one function, the self.track. What that's going to do, we're going to implement one final function called track. So this is a function that's not native to the internal NumPy array, but it means that we can use it internally to track. You notice that every time we access the NumPy array, we call track. And every time we set an item in the NumPy array, we call track. So transparently from the outside, it looks like we're just accessing elements of an array. But internally, this class is saying, OK, you've actually accessed the element of the array. I'm going to do something else and then return the array element you've just accessed. So it's transparent. And we're going to track which element was accessed and how it was accessed. It was a get or a set. And when this happens, we're going to do something to the four different lists that we created. So maybe we created indices, values, access type, and full copies. What we're going to do there is whenever something's been tracked, we're going to say what index was accessed or set. What's the value of that when it was accessed? how it was accessed whether it was a get or a set and last but not least we're going to create a full copy of the array itself when it was accessed that means we have an internal snapshot basically of the state of the array to do that we're going to just append this full copies the numpy.copy of the full array so that's how that's implemented so we're basically creating a transparent class that's going to from the outside, when accessing it, how we're doing it in this script only. So we're only going to need the get item, set item, and length functions. It will return as if it's just a normal NumPy array by using the NumPy array inside the tracked array. But then we will be able to do things like access the variables from the outside. And these variables are tracking variables or variables to which we have said that whenever this get item, set item is called, so when these magic methods are called, we're going to track that state or what happened. This is in the wrong place. And there we go. We need one more way of doing this is that we need to define a function when we actually want to get these things. What we could do is because sometimes you might want to say, OK, when something is tracked, we'll call that an activity. And what we want to do is we want to be able to return that. So we want to be able to say, OK, what uh, give me a list of the activities. So what index was accessed and what operation was performed? And this will be useful later on, as you'll see. Let's go ahead and implement that. So here we've called a function called get activity. And if we pass it an index, it will return a tuple of the index that was accessed and also how it was accessed. And if we don't give it an index, so if the default argument is known, we'll just return a list of tuples of the index that was accessed and how it was accessed, whether it was read or write. I'll sort out the indentation, and that's that. And since we're going to be making an animated plot, we have no reason now to keep two plots. I'm going to delete the first plot. That just shows the unsorted array, because obviously the unsorted array will just be the first frame of the animation. We then need to decide what we're doing. So we're going to go ahead and where we created our array. So we created an array, we shuffled it. We're now going to say that that array is equal to a tracked array. So we're going to wrap our array in this function, in this class called tracked array. So we'll go ahead and run it. We have an error which we can easily fix. It's a spelling mistake. So it's always good to check your spelling. Go ahead and run that. You'll see it still returns our second plot, which was the sorted plot. But now one advantage of spider is that it has a very good variable explorer. So if you go ahead and look what array is, you'll see it's a tracked array object. And this might not come up well over low resolutions, but basically it tells you everything that we've defined within the object itself. So our get activity method, access type, etc., And we can see the access type list, the full copies list, the indices list, and the values list have now all been populated. 2,131 elements. That means there were 2,131 accesses to the array while sorting. If we comment out our quick sort, reinsert our insertion sort, run it again. See, we get the same sorted array. But now if we look at our array object, so our tractor object, we see now that there is 14,000 operations that were performed. So you get an idea now of why the insertion sort is taking so much longer to sort it because it has to access more elements. And every access takes time. And now what we want to be able to do is actually visualize this. So we want to create an animation 
that reflects the steps taken. So we'll go down, we'll turn the size of the list to 30 again. So we have less numbers to sort so that we can get the animation to finish a bit quicker. Basically what we're going to do, like we've seen in my other videos, we're going to use this thing called the function animator, which we imported here. And we're going to say the animation object is a function animator object. It takes a figure, which we've already created. It calls a function called update, which we must define. The number of frames will be the length of these full copies. So if you remember, if you look at these tracked array, click on this, the length of full copies, 40,296. That's how many times something was done within the array itself. That's how many frames we want on our plot. We want it to blit. So blit means only when something's changed on the plot should it redraw, and it only redraws that one point. So that just makes the plotting faster. We want an interval of 1000 milliseconds divided by the FPS. So for example, if this is 20 FPS, we know that the interval it should wait is 50 milliseconds and we don't want the plot to repeat in this case. So one thing we need to do now is we just need to create some variables that describe the global state of our animation. So let's define an FPS variable. So we'll create these at the top. FPS equals 60. So we'll go for 60 FPS. It might be suitable for Suitable for my computer, but for, uh, for, for your computer, you might need to drop this down a bit. But one thing to say is if this animator can't run at 60 FPS, it just runs slower. It doesn't miss anything. Th think of this as a upper limit of the FPS that it will try and draw. And now it's complaining that we don't have an update function. So an update function basically says what has changed in the plot. What do I need to change and what does the animator need to change? So let's create the function update. And it always gets a frame number. So the current frame from this list here. Create our update function. And we tell it what's changed. When we create our bar chart, the first thing we need to do is actually be able to get the object that it has created. So when you do axe.bar, create a bar chart, it returns something called a container, which is a container of patches. So it's basically a list of, it's an object that stores all the individual patches with each individual patch being the rectangle itself. So we can go ahead and implement that. Then in here, in the update function, we need to say, so for each rectangle and height, because remember we want to change the height of each rectangle, so we can double those up. In, and then we need to create a zip, which will basically return a tuple of a rectangle and a height. So the rectangle is base, is just the container of patches that will return the rectangle object. And then to get the actual height of the of the bar, that's going to be the full copies. Remember the full copies is a full copy of the array. And then we can index that using the frame because we've defined our frame in such a way that it goes from zero to the length of this. So that's the zips together. And then we say rectangle.set height. We can set it to that height. We can also do rectangle.set color. And this will be important later on because we're actually going to change the color depending on whether it's been accessed as a set or a get. So we'll set that color to the default matplotlib color, which should be this 1f77b4. And then importantly, this function update must return a list of things or a tuple of things that have been updated. So the easiest way to do that is to just use the splat operator on the container. Okay. And we have some errors here because I didn't spell rectangle right. Remember, always check your spelling. And there we go. So we've actually now successfully created our animation, which is showing how the sorting algorithm actually works. So every time an element is accessed in the array itself, remember we're tracking all the element accesses. Every time an element is accessed, we create a snapshot of the array. And then all we're doing now is plotting those snapshots. So it's showing you how it evolved over time. And this is really nice because you can really see how the insertion sort will take a small element here and it will keep trickling it down until it's in its right place. And then come back up the array, find the next element, trickle it down until it's in the right place. Likewise, likewise, all the way until the end in which we have our sorted array. So that's working and that looks really nice. Now we can go ahead and add some nice to haves to this. So we probably want to know how many accesses have been performed at that time. So to do this on the axe, we're going to use axe.text. 
and the axe.text returns the text object which has been created. Let's plot that at 0, 1000. And let's not actually populate the string yet because in our update function, that's where we're going to populate it. So we can say text dot set text. And again, we can use an F string here. And then we can write something like accesses equals and then frame because we know that the, the frame number is the current item in the list that was accessed. So sequentially, what was accessed, the gets and set. And then again, we need to tell the update function that we have changed text. If we don't tell it it's changed, it won't bother redrawing it. Always remember your spelling. And there we go. It tells us how many accesses have been performed at this particular point in time. You'll also notice that this is not running at 60 FPS. So obviously the computational complexity in order to actually redraw these rectangles takes longer than 1 60th of a second. So it ends up plotting much slower. Let's we'll look at the idea. So this is now a nice to have. And much like a lot of these videos on YouTube, you will see a color representation of the current array element being accessed. So we can go ahead and add that. So if you remember, we had this method inside our class, which was called get activity. So we can say, if we give it an index, it will return the index that was accessed and the operation that was performed. Let's go ahead and get that. Remember it returns a tuple, which will be the index and the operation performed. Let's say get activity at the current frame number. And then we can say if the operation was a get operation, let's set the color to magenta. So container.patches at that index, we call magenta. If not, so if the operation was a set operation, let's copy that code and instead we'll make it red. So magenta means it's a get operation. So it's basically reading that element from the array. And the set operation means it's setting that element of the array. Let's go ahead and just get rid of some of our little warnings about code styling. So it's good to have nicely styled code. Let's go ahead and run that. And there we go, you see. So now we have the situation where whenever an element is being read, it is magenta. Whenever an element is being, is being written, it's red. And this then just goes through and shows us exactly how it's sorting. So this is now very similar to those algorithms you see on YouTube, where they're showing the, the visualization of a sorting algorithm. I think is very nice. Let's just go ahead, uncomment our quick sort algorithm. And remember to comment out the insertion sort because when this tracks array just tracks accesses. So we'd have to reset it between and also reset the original array. Let's just go ahead and comment it out. So we start from scratch. And now we see how the quick sort works. You can see it's a lot quicker and it, does, it doesn't operate in quite the same way. It's insertion sort, you see it's doing a lot more reads. And more specifically, it's doing very different reads and writes. So there we go. So you saw that nice little chirp at the end. It goes up and that took considerably less time. So all this is really nice. Well, one thing we do notice is that the time it's taken is now longer. And that's because at each point where we're getting our setting, we are, track, we are doing a full copy of the array. This time is not as representative anymore of the actual algorithm itself. Or maybe it is because actually every time we access the item, whether it's a get or a set, we're still doing a full copy of the array. And that's true for both the insertion sort and the quick sort. So I think the time should scale with both of them equally. And we can go ahead, increase the number of elements again. See what happens. And again, we can see how it sorts. And I think this is really nice. So it's a nice way of visualizing how a sorting algorithm works. And you can go ahead and just watch that. I appreciate all your hard work. And you'll also notice the two software algorithms we've chosen are both in place algorithms. So that means the array itself is maintained and elements are swapped and moved about. There are other sorting algorithms that are not in place. So they'll, have, they'll, con they'll create another array to store various things such as indices or values. For example, our different states or subarrays. But by using the in place sorting algorithms, we can actually do plots like this with our simple tracked array object. And you must appreciate how, how simple this was to do. All we did was create a very simple class that just overrode some functions and from the outside just appears as a normal array. But whenever we access some array elements, it would track that. And that tracking allowed us to actually plot how that array changed in time.
I think is absolutely awesome. So now we can go ahead and actually create a movie of this. So this will be the last part of the video. We'll go ahead and create a movie because obviously seeing these in Python is quite nice, but sometimes you'd maybe like to upload this to YouTube or you'd like to share this with someone else. And maybe you don't, they don't have Python. Maybe they can't just run this code arbitrarily. So let's go ahead and change it. So to do that, the easiest way just to write in the update function. So every time the function updates to do something like fig.savefig, you then give it a file name. We're going to say an F string. Remember F strings allows us to put variables inside the string. We're going to say, save it to a folder called frames. And then we're going to give it a file name of the sorter. So for example, if it was quick sort, it'd be quick and then underscore and then the frame. And then there's another inputted variable. We're going to give it the actual frame variable here. And we're going to format that to five digits. And it's going to be padded with zeros. There will be no decimal place. This shouldn't matter because this number here is an integer. We just want to ensure that it doesn't give any decimal point. And then we're going to save with a PNG extension. And then in the folder where this is saved, we're going to create a folder called frames. So in this particular instance, the frames is empty. When we go ahead and run our code, you'll see now that the folder starts to be populated and it's populated based on what's happening here. For each frame that's displayed on our animation, creating a snapshot. Go ahead and look at any one of the frame you can see, created a snapshot at that particular point. And the reason I do this, so I tend to create the animations and output them as pictures, because that gives you greater flexibility later on then animating it as a video because most of the time when you output a video it will be lossy compressed which means that some of the visual detail will be lost a good way to do this would be to if you use matplotlib you can use the ffmpeg writer to actually write this animation directly to a video but what i like to do is just take the frames as they are put them in a folder then i will come back here and i'll do something like this so i will make a batch file for example here I've made one called make movies if I go ahead and edit that batch file and have a look so we know that in this folder called frames there are many many images each representing one frame of the animation as we saw and their name is quick underscore frame and then f at least five and at least five places each padded with zero so that allows us to quickly create a movie on this so we can say ffmpeg remember you need ffmpeg installed if you don't have ffmpeg installed you can check one of my other videos i'll probably place the card somewhere in the video but we write a command like this ffmpeg minus y means yes go ahead and delete any file that exists to so say i create a movie with a certain name if I try recreating the same movie with the same name, it will ask you, will ask you, do you want to override this? And you say, no, I do that. And the advantage of putting this in a batch file is that it's, it's basically there. You could do this all in PowerShell, but if you do it in PowerShell, the next time you load, you have to cycle through to get to the command. Just, I find it a lot easier to actually do this in a batch file. Have a look, minus Y and then minus R. This is saying, read these images in 60 frames per second. Because remember, that's the frame rate of the movie. And to give an input so we know that each of these frames is in a folder called frames we know its name is quick underscore frame and then we know it's five it's a five digit width number with zero padding so we can say a point percent with a double percent here because in a batch file percent means a variable so we need to do a double percent to escape and that so say percent percent five d zero five d PNG, so that will mean look for files called 0000 and 0001, 00002, 00003, etc. etc. So that's now put the input from here. And then we need to say, okay, now I want to create a H H264 encoded video. So libx264, so that's the common MP4 format. 
I go for animations like this, I always go for a preset very slow. That means take extra time in trying to make the file size smaller. I give it a constant rate factor of zero, which means lossless quality. So every single frame in the video will be the exact quality that was in the original image. So there's no loss. It doesn't lose any color or any artifacts. And then we give it an output file. So let's call this quicksort mp4. If you're using Notepad++, you can download an extension called NPPEXEC, which allows you to execute code. If not, it's very simple. We can go back to our original folder. We can shift and right click, open Windows PowerShell here. Then we can go ahead and just run the batch file. They're called make movies. So we type this command here. Make movies.bat. Enter. Launches FFmpeg. You'll see it working through the frames. And it finishes. We then have a movie in our folder. Have a look, we called it Quicksort MP4. And there we go. So we've now created a movie from our individual image frames. This movie would now be able to be uploaded somewhere. You could also do things like create animated GIFs, which I'll put in another card in the video. One of my other videos on how to do that. You could also create WebMs, for example, if you wanted to upload it to Wikipedia or things like that. I think that's where I'll leave this video today. It's probably gone quite long by now. But in general, We've got to the point now where we've successfully implemented our two sorting algorithms and then created a method to actually output those frames. Once those frames are outputted, we then made a movie from them. And in the next video, we'll do one better. If I play this, that's what we'll be doing. We'll be implementing a sound which plays depending on which element has been accessed. So for example, if the element accessed is a large value, we'll play a higher frequency sound than if the element accessed is a lower value. And then we'll add that to our movie to complete the tutorial. So thanks for watching.